So my name is Melanie. Um, I'm 31 years old. Um, and this is my testimony of how I found Jesus. Um, and yeah, who I was before, who I am after, and all of that. <clears throat> so I grew up in a good family. It was a really good, loving home. Um, there were four of us. There are four of us. Uh, but there was no talk of God or anything spiritual. Um, we just kind of like played sports and uh, my parents worked a lot and was really focused on school and things like that. We were a very busy family. We took a lot of trips. We had a lot of fun together, but nothing spiritual or anything like that. I was very, uh, like I was a very um, intense child. <laughs> I worked really hard in school. I had straight A's. I was a competitive figure skater. I like from a very young age, I played all these different sports. I played piano, I played the trumpet, uh, I was on the choir, uh, in the school band, I was in all the sports teams. So I was very busy and I was, I was naturally good at like a lot of things that I tried. So, and I learned like very young that this kind of got me a lot of like praise, um, was being good at like activities and things like that. So it kind of developed into like a perfectionism. So I was very, uh, like when I would try something, I wanted to be good at it and I wanted to be good at it right away and I wanted to be the best at it. I wanna say though, actually like in in those early years, there was like that, but then there was also like, I was very shy. And uh, like, I remember from a young age, like having like insecurities and like body image issues. Always like when I was very young, I always thought that I was fat. Like I always had like really, uh, I was always insecure about my body. That like started from a pretty young age and just like for young girls too, just like the messages and the images that we're seeing, um, you know, you're always seeing like a certain body type and that kind of thing. And I grew up listening to all like the pop stars and pop music, like Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera and like NSYNC, all of them. And in all of that music, there's like real like sexual undertones. From that young age, you're kind of like having seeds planted of like like sexuality from a very young age and like you're singing these lyrics not really know what they're meaning i didn't realize how like that was kind of like being implanted in my psyche and from a very young age like i had these sexual experiences with friends um at like sleepovers and stuff where it was just like exploring sexual touch and uh like not really understanding what it was but like kind of knowing we shouldn't be doing that from there like i remember even in like grade six, seven, eight, like at school, like things started getting more sexualized. Like I remember there was girls who like really experimented sexually. And then me and my friends, like we always had boyfriends more and more like, introduced to like, sexuality um, without our parents knowing. When I got to high school, like I immediately, like things just kind of immediately got dark, honestly. Like I quit most of the sports that I played, I quit. I stayed figure skating, praise God for that, um, because I think that that saved me in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, I quit most of the sports that I had done. And uh, I had these two friends in high school, like they were like supposedly my best friends, but they, when we got to high school, it was like they decided that I was no longer cool. And so they, they started just bullying me like crazy and just like, the way girls bully too is like, it's very manipulative, like, and very sneaky. And like, they'll talk behind your back or like, I remember that was like the days of MySpace and like, um, like on MySpace, you have like top friends and they would put me in their top friends and take me out and they would like make plans with me, then cancel and then go hang out together. And it was just like constantly things like that. So, but they would always have excuses. So it just kind of like, was like, oh, okay, maybe, you know, like I'm wrong, but it was like so manipulative how they were bullying me and it, in my mind it like was getting reinforced that I, there's something really wrong with me and like I started thinking that I'm like really weird and that um like out of our friends like I'm the ugly weird one and and I started getting very insecure like a lot more insecure like that the little bit of insecurity I had in those younger years like really started growing like from that experience so I in my teen years like I was very insecure and just like I, I I became very sad like um we started like drinking and experimenting with smoking weed and stuff and um in grade 10 we started going to parties and 
we partied like crazy in high school. Like I became friends with like the party girls and like I was a party girl too. Like I won't, you know, say I wasn't, but uh, so like every weekend we we're somehow finding parties, like either bush parties or house parties or this or that. And like um, I had a fake ID when I was like 16 and uh, yeah, I was 16 when I had my fake ID. Um, and uh, yeah, so we were just like partying a lot, drinking a lot. And in that you, I mean, I'm just lying to my parents all the time about what I'm doing. There was a few times where I drank too much and had to call them. Um, so they thought that I had just experimented a couple of times, but it was constant, constantly uh, partying every single weekend. It was, it was pretty crazy. It was madness. At that time too, like I was still doing really well in school though. Like I, like I still was getting like straight A's. I was still figure skating competitively. And with figure skating, you have to, you have to do minimum five days a week of practice. So sometimes I don't understand how I kept all that up. Like, it's like crazy that I was all these things at once. It's just crazy when I look back. But so I, I, when I look back, it's like, I was like three different people. Like I was like, I had this image of like the perfect child, you know, like she's a competitive figure skater and she gets straight A's. And I kept that persona up, um, in front of like family and, and, and like family friends and extended family and stuff. And with friends at school, it was like, we were crazy partiers and stuff and just like doing shameful things, uh, on the weekends. And then, um, the part that nobody knew was like, I was very, very depressed. Like, um, for, I think for most of high school, like I was very deeply depressed. Like I remember, um, like I would be like most nights, I think in my, in my room, I would just be like crying and crying and crying for hours. Like, and, uh, it makes me emotional to think about it still actually. Um, cause you just look back and you like, just feel so sorry. And like, how the devil just like makes people think that nobody else cares when it's like I had such loving parents that if I would have reached out to them, they would have done something. Um, and to know that there's people that are still in that right now who don't know that Jesus loves them more than anything, you know? Uh, so yeah, that was where I was at. Like I had so much like self-hatred. Um, like I remember I said this the other day in sharing my testimony, but I remember I looked in the mirror, I would look in the mirror and just like have such like hatred for myself. And like, I would, I would just look at like the parts of myself and just have such like a hatred. And I would just try and find something that I liked about myself. And I would try and like affirm those things. And uh, it was such a battle like that nobody knew I was going through. Um, but I was going through that like sadness and inner pain on the inside, but on the outside, like I was really mean, like I was, very rude to my parents um and my brother and i was very i was i was quite mean actually to my friends at from school um and that was kind of like the only way i let it out or showed people that something was wrong it was like i think i was like afraid of showing any kind of weakness or something like and i don't know yeah it was like i was afraid of people knowing that like i was so deeply sad and just like in so much pain. I don't know. Yeah. I just thought that nobody would understand. And so I just kept it so tied up inside. Um, so that was those years. Um, and then moved away to university. And so my testimony is really long. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, uh, yeah. So moved to, moved away to university and, uh, kind of just kept with partying, but I remember going away to university and being like, I am so partied out. Like that's how much we partied in high school. <laughs> like I was partied out by the time I went to university, but it was like, well, what else are you going to do? So that's what we still did. Um, only this time, like you don't have parental supervision. Um, so yeah, I kept partying and like more ex sexual experimentation and things like that. And just like, I found myself in these like relationships with men where I, it was like we would be we would we would be sexually intimate uh but like without like a long term commitment or like um any kind of commitment and it created this like 
like it was like a spirit of rejection. I was constantly being afraid of, I was constantly afraid of rejection because of like all the insecurity I had. And that was, yeah, that was like playing out in those relationships. So I kept finding myself in these relationships where like we would have like a good emotional connection and then we would be sexually intimate and then um, it would just kind of like fall apart. And uh, I, I, it was like, I, it just kind of fed into this belief that like there's something really wrong with me like I'm so weird I'm so ugly I'm just and my fear was like at my core I'm just not lovable like mm. you know I grew up like my family like, my parents always had a really great marriage like they like I remember like they weren't perfect obviously but like my most of my memories of them are like they genuinely enjoy each other's company and like have fun together and like they would go to concerts together and just like enjoy each other and so it was just like the most thing that I wanted was a, like a husband and a family and just like I just didn't know how to like open up to people because I was so afraid of rejection so I feel like I like would get into this like performance thing of like oh you know like guys like I remember being very young and being like guys like when you laugh a lot at their jokes so I would just like laugh a lot at their jokes and like it wasn't like genuine and so I just would try and do things that I thought would get me liked um but that just wasn't genuine uh because of that spirit of rejection which is so funny because it's such a self self-fulfilling prophecy right and uh yeah so that that created like this real like desperation to like find a relationship and find like the one like find my true love and stuff like that so that was like a major idol for me of like if I just find like the right guy then like I'll feel okay like I'll feel happy because I was still battling with like really intense depression and just like self-defeating thoughts um and school started getting harder like I had to actually work hard uh in university to like maintain my marks but I still did and then somewhere in that time like I I ended up going on this volunteer trip to Costa Rica to like set up medical clinics in Costa Rica I mean, it had, it was absolutely the Lord that like put that across my path. Cause at that time it was like, uh, I had a friend who was like, oh, you want to help me organize like this party trip to Cancun? Like if we get enough people to sign up, we get a free trip. So that was an option that I was considering. And then I came across this other option of um, like volunteering for spring break. And it was like one of those choices that like the Lord gives you along the way of like, you're either going to come closer to me or you're going to go further away from me. And then I ended up doing, praise God, the volunteer trip. And it was like so incredible and just like transformative for me because um, I remember like reading my journals from then and I wrote like, I have never felt so full. Like there's so much meaning and, you know, we're having conversations about like real things, about being of service to people and helping people. And what I came back with from that trip was like, hey, I want to devote my life to helping people. And I was like, that's all that matters. Like, cause I remember in high school, like I started like questioning things a little bit and being like, you know, just like bigger picture questions of like, what's the point of life? And, you know, like it had like a depressed flavor of like suicidal thoughts, but also like, what is the point of life? Like, why are we actually alive? Like that question was like always in my mind of like, why am I even alive? Like, I don't understand why I'm alive why I was born with so much privilege in such a good family when so many people weren't. How is this fair? And like, what am I to do? And I had all these questions. So that trip gave me that peace of like, I need to help people. Like I have, for whatever reason, I have a lot and I need to help people and give to people. So that's what I came back with. And so I, um, it really changed my heart with that and just like pursuing that more. And that was such a blessing because I kind of, let go of like the idol of like finding a man and just really focused on like that purpose and meaning. And at that time too, I started seeking more spiritual knowledge and I ended up landing on Buddhism and read a whole bunch of books about Buddhism and liked a lot of the pieces like from that I learned from it, like, you know, like kindness and compassion and mindfulness and all that stuff. And, it, um, and I think I like to that, like, from what I read of like, I read so much by the Dalai Lama, like he became an idol for me for sure. Um, but just, it said like how you can apply the principles of Buddhism to like any religion basically. Um, so that appealed to me. And I started being a, like a practicing Buddhist and I 
meditated every single day. And in that, I was like, okay, I actually want to understand why I'm so sad and so mad. And when I started meditating, I started seeing like my thoughts are so like negative and I'm just thinking horribly about myself and about everybody in the world. And like it was con realizing that my thoughts were constantly negative. So like now from a Christian perspective, it's like I was learning how to take my thoughts captive. Um, but just without Christ, it's like it's really, really hard to do that. Like you have to work really, 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 really hard. So I, I had to work really hard. Um, to try and do that. But it was helping a little bit. Like I would catch my thoughts like in day to day life of like, oh, you know, that thought is a lie. It's not true. And so I was just it was like me kind of like resisting the devil in a way um, being like, no, that's not necessarily true. Like that thought that I'm garbage is not necessarily true. So I learned to just kind of let go of those thoughts. But it wasn't complete. It wasn't enough. Like I was still empty. Right. So I kept kind of searching more and more. And it, it kind of led me deeper into like more new age practices and so and teachings and so I uh, I started practicing yoga um, gosh I don't even remember the order of things but I started learning about the origins of yoga and like Hindu philosophies and stuff and um, I even like read a bit of the Quran I had it like gifted to me from a cab driver so I just started ser searching all these different religious faiths um, but the new age stuff, like, I mean, I just kind of pulled from everything, but the new age stuff really just grabbed me. Cause I mean, with the new age stuff, you can just kind of like, you know, like pick what fits for you. And just like, it's really like self-fulfilling. And, you know, at that time I was like getting really into like the self-help books and stuff and like, um, law of attraction, think positively and th stuff like that. So yeah, I got really deep into that stuff. Um, you know, I was, I was like buying the crystals and I had like a little crystal book about like, you know, this one is for love, that one's for money, this one's for protection and, um, all those lies. <laughs> um, and I, I started doing like Reiki and, and all that stuff. Um, and then at that time I, I ended up meeting my now husband. He would talk, he was like someone different for me. Okay, like he, he's actually a very important part of my testimony. Yeah, he's a very special part of my testimony. Because when I met him and we, we would hang out and he would talk about such deep things. And um, I was like, wow, he has like truth that like I need, you know, like he knew things and like spoke about things in such a deep way. And he was so genuine and honest. And it was like, I just wasn't used to people being so genuine and just like, he would say things like, he was like teaching me the Bible just by like how he would speak. Like he would say like, um, like if he was, if someone wronged him, he would say, you know, I still wish them all the best. I still love them, you know? And I, it, like, I had never heard anyone talk like that before. So I was like, wow, like he is so, like, he's so good. He has such a good heart. Like, and it just captivated me. But there was one part, like when we, in our early days of dating, you know, him and I are very different on the surface. Like we're different races from different countries and stuff. But I remember one time he, uh, we were just driving, we were driving down, down the street and we saw someone in a wheelchair who looks like he's like, uh, like paralyzed or something, like can't really move. His worker was like pushing him across the street, but his shoe fell off. And then he kind of starts like shaking. Um, and the girl's just ignoring him. And then, um, my husband, boyfriend at the time, he, he's like, he dropped his shoe. And then he pulls the car around and just like, without thinking, just pulls the car around and goes, Hey, he dropped his shoe. And then she's like, Oh, thank you. And then she picked up his shoe and, and he got a shoe and he stopped the, the guy in the wheelchair, stopped shaking and stuff. <clears throat> and then Jay says to me, like, you know, people think they don't have sense, but they have sense. Like he was trying to tell her and she wasn't listening. And he was like visibly angry about like, the injustice and that was something so like important to me too because I've, I've worked with like a lot of people with like mental disabilities and stuff like that and that's something that infuriated me was like how people think oh we're so different or like oh they're so dumb or like things like that but it's like we're actually not different at all like if you would just listen to to people who on the surface might look different and so like that just you know he I just saw like he had such a heart of gold and so he would talk about God and he would say like, oh, we should pray and stuff. And, 
And I'd be super awkward, like, oh, I don't know how to pray. Like, I don't know, God, is God real? I don't know. Um, and he's planting all these seeds, right? And he's, we would have these philosophical conversations and he'd be like, you should read the Bible. Like, it's in the Bible. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, like Christianity. Like, it was the last place I ever thought, like, I should look was like the Bible and Christianity. Yeah. I just thought like, no, that's just like brainwashing and oppression and, you know, colonization. Um, so that's not for me, thanks. Along the same time, like I'm getting deeper into new age, I started experimenting with like psychedelics and stuff, thinking that they were like, I thought psychedelics were for healing. And this is really big right now. It's like, you know, psychedelic medicine, which is a lie. Like it's a counterfeit of like the true healing of Christ, like the true healing of the gospel. Like the psychedelics are just a complete lie. And I really feel to say that because a lot of people are falling for it right now. Psychedelics are not healing. They are leaving, leading you deeper into de deception and deeper into uh, brokenness, um, period. But yeah, so I started getting into that and I started introducing psychedelics to him. Like we started taking psychedelics with each other. So like talk about like Eve giving Adam the apple, right? Like um, it was exactly that. So um yeah, getting more into new age stuff. And I was getting really into like feminism and stuff like that. And so him and I would be butting heads like crazy. Like um, I just wasn't like honoring him as like a man and just like, you know, men and women are different. There's things men know that women don't and vice versa, right? And I would just like get into these arguments with him and be super hard headed and just like, um, yeah, very like make things really hard for him. I was very argumentative, know it all, like, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah, so that created like a lot of turmoil in our relationship. But yeah, at that time too, like I decided to pursue a career in, in therapy. So I said, I'll become a psychotherapist. So that's kind of the route I went. Um, I started working in that, working in that field. Like it's, you just see the corruption in the mental health field. Like, um, I worked at some government agencies and stuff and just like, some of the things that workers do behind their client's back is just like appalling. Um, and that's just the truth of it. Right. Like, uh, but yeah, like just quick examples of just like, you know, people would go into the, to the hospital if they're having like a mental health crisis and then, um, end up getting traumatized, um, because of something the worker, one of the workers said, or there's actual abuse that goes on too. So I'm, as I'm like getting into the mental health field, I'm like, this is corrupt. Like there's actually a lot of wickedness in here. And I didn't like, I was like, man, I thought we were here to like help people and heal people guys. Like, why are we gossiping about clients? Why are you guys like, I didn't understand that. Like, it's like, I thought you were here to help, not like make fun of clients behind their backs, which is what a lot of people do. Um, and there's a lot of pride too, of like therapists and stuff like that, thinking that they're God, they're the savior and stuff like that. And you see that very quickly, right? Um, so I'm kind of like waking up to these things too, of just like the ways of society and just like even the justice system, how there's, there's no justice in the justice system, like how it's so corrupt too. And just like, even the education system, like in my, okay, in my schooling, I learned the best way for education for kids to learn. And this is like over and over the research shows this. I feel this is important to say too, that the best way for children to learn is in small groups where they can discuss together um, and be like actively involved, right? Like this education style of a bunch of kids just sitting and looking at the front and listening to one teacher who is supposed to know everything is like so like research shows over and over again that it's, it's not helpful. Like kids can't learn that way. Like there's a few that can, but majority cannot. Like statistically, it's a significant statistically shown thing <laughs> that like, it's just not the best way of instruction. So I'm like, well, why do they still do it? Like they know it's not. And then over time it's like, well, cause maybe the education system isn't, you know, really designed to like, uh, give us the proper education, you know? And that kind of, so I'm just like seeing all these little pockets of like, things are not what they seem, right? Uh, waking up to these truths. Um, and then I had, uh, I had my first son, uh, I had my first son, um, and uh, it was, a, it ended up being an unplanned C-section. Um, and uh, that kind of woke me up to like the corruption in um, the birth field uh, in the medical system and just um, like how they, how they sabotage a lot of women's births, like a third of every birth 
is ends up in C-section, which is just like outrageous. There's no need for that. And it's because there's so much pol politics behind it. It's, um, and like along a, a pregnant woman's journey, they plant seeds of fear along the whole prenatal journey. Um, and then when the birth time comes, like they kind of like, and this is what happened to me with my firstborn. They will, you know, monitor and assess you and cervical checks and all that. Um, and when, what you don't realize is like the physiology of our bodies is like that goes against all of the physiology of what our bodies need to do to birth. Like when someone's poking you and prodding you and checking you and all that stuff, your body can't relax and soften and open to birth a baby. So, um, and that's, that's just common. Like, I really feel like people need to understand that, like that they, we can't birth babies well with that. And so the medical system ends up creating these emergencies that they say they are saving us from. Um, so that's what happened to me. I ended up with a C-section and it was like, it was devastating for me. Like it was, uh, like I, I had a lot. Yeah. My journey into motherhood was, um, was intense, I guess you could say. Um, yeah. So in those early days of like, uh, when my son was just born, when he was a baby, um, trying to figure out motherhood and all that. I got very isolated. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just like realizing all of these things of the world and, um, without Christ, like it just, you become very hyper vigilant and just like, like no rest. Like you, you, it's like I had no rest, um, because you're like, I was waking up to all these like like all this like wickedness, but like, I didn't have the answer of Christ. So it was just like, okay, I got to protect my son from everything, <laughs> which is like impossible. I mean, you can't do it without Christ. You really can't. Um, so, um, yeah, I was dealing with that. Um, and yeah, again, very isolated in my postpartum and just like in my son's early years, um, I was still doing like kind of surface level new age stuff. Um, uh, <laughs> There's no such thing as surface level, but like I was still practicing some new age stuff. Um, and then I started getting like really deep into it. Like I was like, okay, you know, I'm learning all these like theories about the universe and um, spirit and things like that. But now I want to actually practice and like mm -hmm. communicate with the spirit realm. Like I wanted to have like supernatural encounters and spiritual um, connection. So I was like pursuing that. Um, so I got into really into like shamanism and I started practicing like shamanic journeying, um, which if you, if, you know, if you're watching and you don't know what that is, it's like, basically you're using like the drum or rattle to, um, to put yourself into kind of like a trance state and then your spirit kind of travels. Um, and then when your spirit travels, they say you go and meet your your power animal or your helping spirits or your guides. Um, and they will like teach you things or, um, help you with certain lessons or things like that. And the, the man that I learned this from, like, I remember he said, there's nothing to be afraid of, you know, it's all love. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're traveling into these spirit realms, it's all love. There's nothing to be afraid of, which is, I mean, of course, a lie. Like, I mean, just like if you have eyes, like you can see that there is, there's evil in the world. Like it comes from somewhere, right? No, but I believed it. And, um, and I think like when you don't have the answer, like you just believe these lies, like these the shallow lies of like, oh, there's no such thing as evil, like, which doesn't even make sense. But I feel like in some level I believed that. And then I started believing like, oh, all that matters is like your intentions, like the intentions that you set and like you manifest your own reality. Like we are all creating our own experiences. Um, so then you obviously become <laughs> your own God. Right. And like, so then I started like practicing like straight witchcraft, like writing spells and stuff. And like, I was infusing it into like everything. Like I would even make a cup of tea and just like say a spell, like as I'm making a cup of tea, like, but I thought because my intentions were good you know, because I want to heal and I want to help others. You know, I still want to serve everyone, like serve others and serve people and help people. I thought it was good. I didn't understand that like witchcraft is witchcraft. Like there's no good witchcraft. It's just an abomination. I didn't know that. I had never heard of that before. Like I heard people talk about witches and stuff. And I, I would have said at that time that I was like a witch. Um, 
but like a green witch or mm. uh, like, <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, but it's like, it's the same devil, just a different color, right? Like, so I, I mean, I was so deceived. And so I'm getting into all these practices and like, um, like straight witchcraft, like writing spells and stuff. And just like, um, at the same time I was getting into like herbalism and like natural remedies and stuff. And so I was infusing it all together. Like I was so confused and like, like you're, you, I was so confused, but I didn't know, like, cause there's also in the new age, a lot of people have like so much pride to think that they have like secret, special spiritual knowledge. Um, and then if someone's like, if someone points out like, that's actually really weird that you have like, you know, I knew someone who had like little pieces of paper all over her apartment of like spells, like all over. And like, if someone were to point that out and be like, that's actually kind of bizarre. Like, and it's, creating a lot of clutter in your home like they probably myself too like would have been like oh you just don't get it like you're just not awake like there's this pride in the new age that like I absolutely had um but I knew I didn't know it all like I feel like as I was going along the journey I was realizing like wow we're so small and like there's so much I don't know but thank goodness we each create our own realities and all that matters in our, our intention and my intention is good and help people so I thought that um I was okay, you know? I didn't have any, like, understanding of, like, heaven or hell or that kind of thing. I just thought, like, it's your intention and, like, what you think is, like, what you create. Believed and was really practicing that. But still, like, it wasn't complete. Like, you still, like, I still had this, like, hole in my heart, like, this emptiness in my heart. And there would be, like, little practices that I would do. And I would be like, oh, you know, I feel good. Like, I feel relaxed. But it was, like, uh, still like a deep emptiness, um, that I just thought like we all have, you know, like, and I don't know if I had an explanation as to why, like, I think I just thought like, you know, life is hard. We've all been through trauma. And so we're all walking around carrying trauma and, um, it's on all of us to heal ourselves basically. Um, that's what I thought. And so I thought like, oh, we all have like, you know, the trauma we carry and um, effects of that. Not realizing like Jesus like takes out all of, like you will literally be born again. Like once you come to him, like not realizing like you don't have to carry your trauma. Like you literally don't have to. But yeah, I thought you did. So that's what I thought the answer was. Then COVID hit and I ended up getting pregnant with our second son. Um, and uh, I was like, hey, I am not letting that same thing happen in this birth like I'm like I'm going natural like I'm not having a c-section again and I'm gonna be like firm with this like I'm not letting anyone do anything to my body that I'm not okay with and I was just like um really trying to focus on healing on a deeper level um from like the, my past um and then also like the c-section trying to heal um, just like emotionally from that, you know, I had some like therapy, like some good, like secular stuff. Um, and then I got really deep into shamanism and I was doing a lot of shamanic journeying at that time. And like, like getting deeper into that and like with more, like got like learning more about like goddesses and, um, goddess worship and things like that. And like getting deeper into like moon rituals and just like, like rituals in general and but at that time like I I believed there was a God like I believed there was God um but I didn't call him God and I wouldn't have said him um because that sounded too Christian and uh so I called God like source or the creator or great spirit mm -hmm. um so I would be doing like these rituals um these shamanic rituals or demonic rituals and I would just be like um calling in helping spirits and power animals and my ancestors and you know calling in demons is in actuality what it is that pretend to be helping spirits um and then at the end of it I know I would call in creator great spirit and I remember like I just realized this the other day like I would say like thank you for never giving up on me and it would always make me feel like emotional like whenever I would say that and I would say like, you know, we, I do this ritual in the name of the greatest and highest good, or like I'm see, I said something like I'm seeking the greatest and highest good. I knew that I didn't know what that was, but like, that's 
was my intention. That's what I wanted. Um, but somewhere in me, like I knew I didn't know what that was. Um, so I was doing a lot of that. And as I was like preparing for my, the birth of my second son, um, I started coming across like the concept of free birth and unassisted birth, which is when um, basically you give birth without a medical professional. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. But like, I would never do it. I could never do that. That's like, you know, amazing. And like, God created our bodies perfectly to give birth, but like, I could never do it. Um, but like over time, like, and this was the Lord, this was fully the Lord. Um, like I'm starting to feel more and more uncomfortable with my midwives that I was working with. And just like the things they were saying, the language they were using, they're like, Oh, we'll allow you to do this at your birth. If you can do this or that. And they would say like, Oh, you know, typically we have to, um, what did they say? They wanted to check the baby's heart rate every 30 minutes during labor mm -hmm. and understanding, you know, like what I understand from like my field of psychology, like when you do that, you're interrupting the birth process. You're interrupting the physiology that needs to happen. And so then I was trying to like negotiate with them and they said, no, 30 minutes. And that's like all we'll do. Um, and I was like, like somewhere there in me, there was like, if they do that, like they will sabotage my birth again, like all these pieces. And it was the Lord, like all along the way, it's like, and then I was like finally listening and just like, believe, like starting to believe like, okay, my body was designed for this. Like, you know, I didn't fully know God, but like I was collecting little pieces of truth. Like as I was preparing for that birth ended up like, um, we, we stayed like at a rental that was outside of my midwife's catchment so they were like either you need to go to the hospital and give birth or we can't be there at your birth and so I was like okay bye like and so I had to end up deciding like I'm gonna go for an assisted birth um and my my husband was not on board with that like because understandably like from a man's perspective you know he's the protector so he wanted to protect me an unborn baby especially after our first experience um so he agreed if I would have uh, a doula there mm -hmm. and a doula is someone who's not medically trained, but they're there for like emotional support. Mm -hmm. And so by God's grace, I found like a really amazing doula. Um, and she was on the same page as me of like um, COVID and the vaccines and stuff. And um, she was like, I've never done like an unassisted birth before, but like she just like felt something that we should do it. And, mm -hmm. Um, cause we both trust birth and, um, and trust God. Um, so ended up having an amazing home birth, um, unassisted. Uh, it was just my doula and I, my husband, he didn't even make it home in time cause it was so fast. And it was like, um, like the Lord totally redeemed my birth. Um, even like before I like really knew it was him and before I really knew him. And I remember there was this one, this one point where, um, I was like on an exercise ball, like during my labor and I was just kind of like resting on the ball and I was just like swaying and breathing. And one of my affirmations, um, I would say, I said like, it's safe for me to surrender. And then as I'm saying that, I'm like, I surrender to you. I, I fully surrender to you. And it was like, I was speaking to God, mm -hmm. like in that moment, like I had called in all my helping spirits and like this goddess, whoever. But in that moment, it was like, this is God, like I'm surrendering to you, God, like, because in that moment, I knew like, there's a creator and the creator made my body. The creator cares more than anyone else how my baby is born. So in that moment, I was like, I surrender it to you fully. It was all the glory to God. Like now I understand that like that was all him. You know, at the time I thought like, I did this, you know, I did this, but it was God's grace. Like he was like leading me along that way. And like, it was him. And then that moment on the yoga ball where on the exercise ball, when I like, at the time I used it as a yoga ball, but now not anymore. But, um, it, it was like, I just chose to surrender to him and he heard that even though I didn't fully understand what that meant. Um, and then after that, like we, a couple months later, we ended up moving across the country and, uh, when we, when we were like getting rid of stuff and packing up, like we had to fit everything in one car. And I was like, there was a moment where I was like looking at like this Buddha statue that I used to have. And I remember thinking like, I don't need this anymore. Mm -hmm. 
And then I just got rid of it. And mm. I, then I see like this picture of Buddha that I used to have. And I was like, I don't need this anymore. And I got rid of it. Mm. And I didn't know why, but I just like, and it was the Lord. Like, I just knew like, I actually don't need this anymore. And so it was amazing. Um, so yeah, we would go across the country with our two little ones. Um, stayed out in, in Alberta for a little bit. And at that time was when like, um, the freedom convoy, like when that whole thing like started up and like, I felt so hopeful at that. Like, I was just like amazed that people were standing up like for freedom and things like that. And I was like, wow, like, you know, there's so many people who actually like see this for what it is, you know? And then I started seeing like, um, like someone I knew from high school, um, she posted her brother, like a video of him preaching at the convoy. <laughs> and I was like, wait, they went like, he was there. I was like, okay. And then I start hearing more and more Christians who are like kind of speaking up about it and saying it's a spiritual battle we're going through. And I was like, it is like, okay, Christians know something here. Like, cause I knew it was a spiritual battle, but I didn't understand how or what, or what the answer was. And so then I'm seeing like Christians like talking about the spiritual warfare. And then I'm also talking, seeing people that Christians talking about like the end times and mm -hmm. uh, the second coming of Christ. And I was like, I don't know any of this. Like, this is something I don't know about. And like, okay, so these people see that there's a spiritual battle going on. They have things that they know that I don't know. Like, I need to know more about this. So I started like researching more. And then at the time, my husband's like, yeah, it's in the Bible, basically. Like, I've been telling you to read it. And then I'm like, okay, I should read the Bible. <laughs> so finally I bought a Bible. Um, and it was so boring when I tried to read it. So I put it down. <laughs> but then I found this book called, again, this is the Lord that put it on my path. It was called Pre-Colonial Revelations of God. Mm -hmm. And it was written by this Native American couple. The man, uh, his name's Chief Joseph Riverwind, and he's a Taino man. And then his wife, uh, Laralyn Riverwind. Mm -hmm. And in the book, it's all about Jesus. And I, cause I was like, I wonder what like the natives thought about God or like, you know, before colonization. Mm -hmm. um, and they talk about all these native prophecies that are the same as biblical prophecies. Mm -hmm. And like, um, even like different native tribes that had like relationship with God, with creator and who had heard about Yeshua, mm -hmm. like, before colonization and it was and he was just pulling apart like colonization from who Jesus actually is and it blew my mind like I was like oh man I feel chills right now even saying it it was like whoa like there's something to this and it like every rebuttal or question I had like against Christianity was like he just like squashed it in that book and uh so then that friend from high school that I saw preaching at the freedom convoy I ended up I didn't even have him on Facebook um I ended up adding him on Facebook and just like messaging him like you know hey like you know it's been a long time whatever like um I can't even remember what I said but just like asking if he wanted to connect like I'm coming to terms with my faith and wondering if he would be open to chatting and in that too like I was looking at his Facebook page and seeing like um like seeing the circle that he was with and seeing these guys with like tattoos and long hair and stuff. And I'm like, I didn't know Christians like look like this, like, yeah. you know, and then like they're going out and like praying for people and like doing like praying for healings and like seeing miracles and stuff. And I was like, wait, there's actual like spiritual Christians. Like there's actual like, like spirituality in Christianity. Like I had never realized that. I just thought it was like oppressive, like, brainwashing so I reached out to him um and then we chatted we we met over zoom and um there was like certain pieces that he shared with me that like I just knew like this was like because beforehand you know I started praying to God and being like asking for like direction and when I asked like God like should I um should I message him and like I didn't get like I didn't hear like a yes or no. I just heard God be like, be brave, you know, mm -hmm. like, cause I was like, it's so weird. Like, I don't want him to think I'm like, you know, sliding in his DMs or like, you know, it's been so like, I was so weird in high school too. Like, and so, but God was just like, be brave. And that's what I kept hearing. Just be brave. 
Um, he didn't say yes or no. He was just be brave. So um, even then, he was like refining me. Um, and uh, he just shared like certain things that I was like, this explains everything. Like he explained how like, um, you know, God made the world perfect. Um, but like the original sin of the first man and woman, and that's how sin entered the world. So all this like evil and brokenness we see in the world is from sin, that original sin. And all of us like inherit that. And then something he said about that, like really struck me and shook me that I didn't realize was that like, we are all born fallen. Like we're actually born into that. Like, and I, like, I was like, I thought I was a good person. <laughs> like I didn't know I was fallen, but it, then it made sense. I was like, wait, that's, is that why I'm so, de like, I've been so depressed and why I still feel so tired and just like, you know, all that stuff. And he said, um, you know, we all try all these different things. Right. And um, to try and heal and try and be better and try and like fix sin and fix the brokenness. And then I thought about myself and like all these like healing stuff I did, like all the shamanic journeys, all the psychedelics I took, all the this, like everything, all the rituals, like this, the chaos that it all was that I was trying so hard. Um, and then even knowing the mental health field, uh, like they don't know what they're talking about either. Like <laughs> just, there's even research that shows even the the diagnostic terms we use in the mental health field. This one this one study it was a meta analysis and it said the the title of it says um, psychiatric diagnoses are scientifically meaningless um, and like essentially they are. So I'm like okay in the mental health field we don't have the answer and then and then Curtis told me like you know God himself like actually like came to save us and like died for us on the cross and resurrected um saving us from sin because we can't save ourselves and I just knew it was true I was like everything I've seen I can see we can't save ourselves mm -hmm. and then I thought I mean this was the Lord again <laughs> um how my all of my rituals when I would call in the greatest and highest good and then I just heard and I just knew like that actually is the greatest and highest good that there's one God that would actually come and die for us. Like he would actually come and like save us, wow. you know, like I was like, there's, I, there's nothing greater than that. Everything I've been searching my whole life, like there's nothing greater than that. And so I just immediately believed and I was like, okay, so when can we do my baptism? And <laughs> I didn't even know what that, I didn't know what that meant, but I was like, I know this is where I need to go. Um, I didn't understand all the pieces. Um, but I just knew that that was like exactly where I needed to be at that moment. Yeah, but I remember one of the last shamanic journeys that I did. Um, I don't remember the details of it. I don't really remember any of the details of any of them, to be honest with you. But I remember this one. Now I realize it was the Lord. Um, and I heard from something or someone like, you know, you're doing all of these things for healing you know, you say you want to be healed and you're after healing. And um, I had this image that like, if I just could, you know, go off grid and live on the land and like, and things would be simple, then I'll feel okay finally. And so that was like, oh, I just got to move off grid and live off the land and things will be simple. And then this voice was like, you know, you say you want healing and you want things to be simple, but do you actually, do you actually want things to be simple? And kind of like, would you stop all of this stuff? Like, would you give up the healing stuff? And uh, I knew I had to like decide. And I was like, yeah, I would. But I had to decide. And uh, I was like, yeah, I would give this up and live simply. And um, yeah, I think that it was like one of those moments too, where like the Lord, like you have a choice of like um, humbling and like, coming closer to him or just like hardening and going the other way. Wow. And in that moment, it was like, I would give this up and I would be wrong about anything. Like if it meant to live simply and like have peace, you know? And uh, yeah, it was him. And then, so when I heard the gospel and I knew it was true and knew this is the route I'm going, I know this is it. I know this is true. It was the last place I ever would have, I ever, <laughs> it was the last place I looked like, I, I mean, it took me so long to even open up a Bible. Um, 
I used to cringe at the name of Jesus. Um, and I thought, I just thought like, like Christians were just like freaky and like, I don't even know. I can't even remember what I used to think. It was so, it was so false. And just like, I, I was so brainwashed then against Jesus, you know? Um, and then I started hearing like, I, after that, like I was seeing like these people come forward, like from Hollywood saying how like in their contracts, they're not even allowed to say Jesus name. And then I started reflecting on like, wow, even in movies, whenever they like depict Christians or Jesus, they either say his name is like a swear word or if someone loves Jesus, they're like a freak or like just like off the walls or like unhinged or just like unstable or like a really weird like hillbilly redneck who just yeah. is dumb. Like, you know, like it's they're always like painting Jesus in a bad way and anyone who loves Jesus in a bad way. Mm-hmm. So I started seeing that and like being like, wow, okay, maybe it's Jesus. Like if everyone's saying it's not Jesus, maybe it's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, And sure enough, it was. Um, So yeah, then we had another meeting and I, um, I, when I decided to take this step, I, I renounced like all my past sin, just kind of laid everything out that I had done that separated me from God. It was a very emotional and therapeutic process actually. Um, and as I'm saying it, I'm hearing a voice in my head saying like, you know, nobody cares. Like they don't want to hear this. They don't care. Um, just like hurry up and wrap it up. Um, Mm -hmm. and I, now I know, like now I've learned it was actually the voice of a demon trying to like get me to stop Mm -hmm. and like get me to like not go through, go, go through with the process. And But I still went through with it, um, battling those thoughts. And then I look up and like my friend in front of me was actually crying. And it was like, it. and then he's like, oh, I'm sorry. Like I, your story just really touched me. And I was like, wow, like he genuinely does care. And then I, it was like, I realized like the warfare in my mind, like that showed me the warfare in my mind and the lies that I was believing. And then after that, he started commanding spirits to leave me. You know, there was like, he said like a spirit of despair Mm -hmm. and it was just like when he said that it was like oh like that's what this has been for so long like it's been a spirit and when he starts commanding this thing to leave like my body starts twisting twitching and shaking and like um like literally shaking and i'm (laughs) it was like really intense um and then we keep going and like commanding more things to leave. There's like a spirit of witchcraft um, and other stuff. I can't even remember now, but like um, I, I'm starting to understand like and be able to discern as we're going through that process, how the demons are trying to speak to my mind to make me not let them leave. Like they're trying to lie to me. And I was starting to be able to hear that. And then so like they're leaving one by one and my mind is like freeing up and like and then when we finished there was just like it was just quiet Mm. and I was like wow I didn't know my mind was so loud before like until I've actually experienced this quiet and like it was so still and like peaceful and it was like it was just like the presence of God, like for the first time, like I could actually like, like just rest with him. And then, uh, it was crazy because I, when that happened and then the Holy spirit fell on me and I started quoting scripture, just like, it just came out and I'm like, I was stuck in the mud and he picked me up and, and then I'm like quoting that scripture. I didn't know it was scripture though. And then, my friends are like that did you know that that's a bible verse i was like like my jaw dropped it just became so real in that moment like everything that's in the bible is true like i actually mm-hmm. realized this is all true like everything in my life has been leading up to this of like this this literally is the word of god here like it's all true like everything that's written in this bible is right here and it's true and god is real um and jesus is god um He's the only way to God. Oh. And uh, yeah, and then I, I got I got baptized um, in the river. And uh, um, I remember that day there was like a lot of warfare leading up to my baptism because there was a 
there was a stretch of time between my deliverance and my baptism. And it was like such a challenge to find a day that worked to do it. Um, then eventually we picked a day and it, the day was chaotic. Like the, we went to a park cause I wanted to do it in the river and it was chaos. Um, it was so busy at this park. There was no parking. Um, and, uh, it was just, it was just a chaotic day. Um, but then when I went into the water and like, it was like, I, I couldn't even feel the temperature of the water. It was just like the peace and the stillness that I felt of like God's presence was like overwhelming. And then I went into the water and came up and it was just like, um, it was like, it felt like time stopped and, uh, like, I couldn't even speak. Like, someone asked me, like, oh, how do you feel? And I just, like, I couldn't even speak. And it was, like, all the chaos, all the warfare leading up to that, even my whole life leading up to that, like, all the warfare of my life, in my mind especially, it was, like, everything was just gone. And in that moment, it was just, like, me and the Lord. And I just felt like he's, like, you're home, you know? And I just, uh, I, f I just felt his presence so strong for the first time ever. But it was like I knew it was his presence, though, you know? It's like you get, I had glimpses of it, like, growing up. Um, but it just, like, goes away because you're, like, there's so, like, you're so filled with sin, you know? Mm. But then when, when you're, when the sin is gone, when you're, when your old self dies, and you're born again like in him and you're actually just like living in in that place of feeling his presence like you're the peace and the rest and the quiet is just like oh my gosh and it's just him like it's just him it's not like you know before i was seeking healing to feel good to feel okay but now it's like it's only him that i was after like it's just the presence of god uh that i was like after and that I was missing and like ever since then I just feel like I'm falling more deeply in love with Jesus like and who he is like every I feel like I'm always learning new things with him and like um I feel like uh it's like it's brought me back to this like feeling like I'm like a child like and I have this thing like I'll be in prayer and I'm like I'll say to him, like, I feel like I'm like a little girl with like bandages on my knees. Yeah. And, uh, and I just feel like that's how he sees me, you know? And I just feel so loved. And, uh, it's, um, yeah, walking with Jesus is everything, you know? Like, there's, there's really nothing else. Like, there's actually nothing else <laughs> that matters. Yeah. Um, what would be your message to people who are stuck in the new age right now? Hmm. We're stuck in the new age right now. Okay. I want to like speak like directly from my heart. You know, I don't want to sound like wise or uh, persuade, you know, like if you're in the new age right now, I just, I know that you're like, I know that you're like actually deeply hurting in your heart and, and really you're looking for like healing. You're looking for love. You're looking for peace um, and truth. You know, I, I know that's what you're looking for. If you're in the new age, I know that's what you're looking for. And you're looking for a home, you know? Um, and and it's, it is Jesus. Like, at the end of all, that is Jesus. Like, he's the only one who actually gives us that, like, complete healing. Like, he is the healer. Like, when we actually come to him we are healed like he heals we don't have to walk you don't have to walk with your trauma you don't have to walk with like the things that happen to you the things that you've done like you don't have to carry that anymore he will just take it lift it off of you and and take it away and you you actually are born again um and the, there's and i also want to say too there's like like okay in the new age like you know there's spiritual power you know that's appealing and it's it's cool to have spiritual experiences right like it's very cool but compared to the spiritual life that you have with Jesus it's nothing like 
Jesus it like ho- actually holds your hand and walks you through every single moment of every single day like and the supernatural and spiritual encounters that you have with him um are like I can't even like they're out of this world like you can't even put words to them like some I tr- struggle to put words to them like the love that he has like he doesn't ask for anything in return he just wants to pour out love to us like and there's there's nothing that compares so like it's jesus that you're looking for if you're in the new age it's is jesus you're looking for um and i would encourage you like in your new age practices like to try and like call on jesus you know like and see how that is you know it might be a little bit of a fight to say Jesus name, but like call on him, you know, just, just test it out. Even like just test out his name and calling him. Um, and he will, he will come because he's waiting for you to call him. Jesus is, you know, so that's what I would say. Melanie, could you just pray for the people who are watching this, who are in transition, who are transitioning from, literally thinking about Jesus or not knowing about Jesus or even questioning if Jesus is real. Could you just like pray for those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questioning Jesus. Yeah. Lord, thank you so much um, for the person that's watching. And thank you so much that you know them so deeply that more than they even know themselves and that you're after them, you're pursuing them. You know, if if this person is questioning Jesus, wants to know more, Lord, I pray that you would answer that and you would just like run them down even harder, Lord, and that they would just have a radical encounter with you. Um, I pray that you would send people to teach them who you are. Um, I pray that they would just have an encounter with you and, and just realize how much you love them, Jesus. There is no greater love than you. Um, yeah, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Melanie, for your testimony. Mm-hmm. You're welcome.